In the post-Shannon world, we've all experienced firsthand how information and communication technologies have transformed humanity in profound and unexpected ways. Our next speaker, Amber Case, studies the roles humans and human behavior play in this ongoing transformation, exploring the interaction between humans and computers and how our relationship with information is changing the way cultures think, act, and understand their worlds. Some of you, like me, may be one of the 1.3 million humans that have viewed Amber's TED Talk. We're all cyborgs now. A provocative look into how technologies are helping us to be more human and connect with one another. Amber is author of the books An Illustrated Dictionary of Cyborg Anthropology and Designing Calm Technology, the, talk, uh, the topic of her talk to us today. Will you please join me in welcoming Amber Case to Bell Labs. Oh, good choice of music, actually. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, Bell Labs has been legendary in my mind for, well, since I was like three or four. Uh, my dad would read me stories at night like uh, naturally intelligent systems and uh, like all of these strange artificial intelligence type stories because my grandpa worked at the University of Utah in computer science and mathematics in the 70s and then my dad worked at a telecom. So you can imagine the types of dinner discussions and Sunday morning infinitely long all day discussions and debates we had about ethics and privacy and technology. So every time I went to sleep at night, I had insomnia because <laughs> the stories he would tell me did not make me go to sleep, as you can imagine. So, uh, so I'm here today to talk to you about calm technology, but first, can you just hold up your phones really quickly? Great, hold on, I'm just gonna take a picture because I need to take a picture. There we go, ah, oh, great. Some of you are late cyborgs, some of you are early cyborgs. <laughs> but we're all cyborgs, like the, every time you interact with a piece of technology, you're in a human computer interface. We've been extending our capabilities into physical tools for a long time. A hammer is an extension of your fist, a knife is an extension of your tooth, and starting with writing and cave paintings, we've also been extending our, um, our, our mental selves into these new tools. And those tools have been fundamentally unstable. What was originally the size of a gymnasium is now, as you know, very small. We now, instead of having many people to one computer, we now have many computers to one person. So today I'm going to talk about this idea of calm technology, which I got from the time machine of uh, Xerox Park. So who's heard this quote? Pretty much lots of people. Okay, so the issue with this quote is that it keeps, it keeps going around, that there's going to be all these devices by 2020, and every time that happens, I like to say, is this actually going to sound good? Uh, because we have this idea of this utopian future. At some point, usually 2020, everything's going to be solved and everybody across the board it will make perfect sense. For instance, instead of having the perfect San Francisco accent to talk to Siri to have it understand you perfectly every time, <laughs> people with any accent should be able to say, hey Siri, where's the nearest location? And Siri won't say, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean and then give you directions to something else. Uh, so I like to think about all the different ways in which these things can go wrong. I already look at things like the smartwatch, which when you actually wear it for the first time, it just kind of defaults to all the notifications that are on your phone. It's not made for the wrist yet, but now you can modify these things with a good bit of work to actually make it very useful to you. Uh, this thing that I keep finding, uh, I won't name the companies that try to come up with this, Obviously, mostly doomed to fail, thankfully, but it will take a while to do this. Um, the smart fridge, which says, some of them are like, you have a payment plan and you add different members of your family and then we come by with a technician sometime between you know, this week and next week and we'll set up your payment plan for you and then you can only have access to these type of foods based on your diet, but then <laughs> if the internet goes out, then you know, or 
you know, people just go into their fridge and you know, nothing is interesting in here or I'm locked out of my fridge, I need a midnight snack and then they'll just snack more. Or if you have a diabetic come over to your house and you can't open your fridge because there's no authorization. I mean, these are these silly scenarios, most of which hopefully won't happen, but the types of people who are designing these new things, they haven't really read a lot of history. They come up with these ideas, they don't understand where it's going to come from and, and what the implications are. And some of these fridges have said, you know, hey, you need to go to the store and buy milk, but they'll send it to you like in the middle of the night. You're out of milk, uh, not contextual, not around the store. And who doesn't go to the store and pick up milk and eggs on the way home, unless you're lactose intolerant, in which you pick up soy milk or lactose intolerant milk, you know. You know what kind of milk you want to get. This is a, a reasonable human task. I mean, I could, you know, get more milk for you. There's another one that's like, the bananas have gone bad. It's like, I don't need to know that the bananas have gone bad. They have a skin that changes color. It's already a technology that tells me whether, what state they're in. It's pretty simple. Why don't we make our technology in the shape of banana skins? Because it'll change based on whether it's good or bad. We don't need a, an alert on our smartphone on a hub that's connected to something going to the internet to tell us what we're doing. It doesn't make any sense. So when I put all these things together, I, I, you have what I call the dystopian kitchen of the future in which you have as many different alerts by different companies written in different languages, often by a bunch of programmers in Silicon Valley that like the newest and best technology, or rather programming language that's fashionable, that they don't want to support after a couple of years, and then it just goes away, and then they leave the company to do something else, and then there's no one to support it, and completely un uncommented code. I've, I've been dealing with this for a long time, that's why I get these very long vignettes about this sort of thing. And heaven forbid having to inherit this kitchen five years down the line, you buy somebody's smart home. Where are the light switches? Oh, it's like this little sticky thing that's stuck to the wall, but it fell off, so now it's behind the bed, and you pick up this old device. How do I change the batteries? Oh, well, you have to get this very special battery. Well, where do I get that? Well, it stopped getting made five years ago. Right, so I, I kind of see this happen. Um, I've grown up in smart homes where I've had voice activated lights, which I do not recommend because if you play music really loud, the lights will just turn on and off like a rave. <laughs> uh, the lights will turn on in the middle of the night while a truck is driving by because the sensitivity is so high and then you have to manually set the sensitivity. There's all sorts of weird things. Uh, so I, I've been thinking about this for, for quite a, a long time. And right now we have this kind of era of interruptive technology. We've got beeps and bloops everywhere from all these different devices. And if we're going to have many more devices per person, than just the things that we have right now, how do we get these devices to not interrupt our lives? Uh, as Mark Weiser at, at Xerox Park said, you know, we need smarter humans, not smarter devices, and the scarcest resource in the 21st century is not going to be technology, it's going to be our attention. So how do we design attention that manages our, our lives <laughs> in a way that doesn't keep on distracting us? And so I, I went back about, about 10 years ago, I was writing my thesis and I was super excited to find this idea of calm technology where you know, I went back and I looked at what these people had built in the <coughs> mid 90s and, and uh, late 80s and they had come up with, as Mark Weiser called it, like a world of pads, tabs and boards where you just had these kind of devices and then they made all of these futuristic things in their time machine and then they found out that they were getting annoyed all the time by all these alerts and weird things. So how could they design things differently? So they went through and made a bunch of experiments and wrote a bunch of papers. My favorite one was called The World is Not a Desktop, um, and this paper, The Coming Age of Calm Technology. But the best thing about The World is Not a Desktop is it talks about our, our focus a lot of times on this desktop like reality, where all of your attention could be focused here, you're sitting down in a seat and you have infinite time and infinite space to figure stuff out, right? When in reality, when we're designing these like connected Internet of Things devices, we're still expecting people to take out their phone, load a dashboard, load something, and click on some buttons in order to do something, like turn on and off your lights. Like We already have a calm technology. It's electricity. It's there when we need it, not when we don't. We can turn on and off the lights. We don't have to update it constantly. It's just there. Now, it took a while to get to that point, but that's a fantastic technology. If it breaks, then something's horribly wrong. If Twitter goes down or the lights in your house go down because you have it connected to a Hue hub and that got knocked out, or you have some sort of Bluetooth that gets knocked out, then, oh, that's not a big deal, it's just fun, right? No, if we're going to rely on these technologies, they need to be a lot more, um, a lot more stable over time. 
So if we have all of our attention here, you have very high resolution attention. As you keep going out to the side, you have, let's say, lower resolution visual attention, but you still have all these other senses that you can, that you can actually make use of, like sound, and you have haptic responses for more personal alerts. There's just so many more senses that you can make use of that don't mean that you have to just focus everything on the visual sense. So this is one of Mark Weiser's quotes. He says, a good tool is invisible. It doesn't intrude on your consciousness. You focus on the task, not the tool. Or in the case of a book, you don't notice the book exists anymore because you're, you're into the story so much that you, know, you like the main character and know them more than your next door neighbor, even though that character doesn't even exist. So let's talk about designing calm technology. How can we design things that make better use of our attention? Uh, so I made a few principles uh, and kind of put them with, uh, with Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown's principles to kind of make a small framework. And this is not necessarily aimed at you. It's, it's aimed at a lot of people who keep trying to make these things without understanding that there's a history behind them. Uh, so technology shouldn't be requiring all of our attention, just some of it, and only when necessary. And you have to design that incredibly well to make sure that that works. Mark Weiser came up with this idea of just, here is a simple tea kettle. You set it, you forget it, you go into another room, you can do any other task you want, and when it's ready, it will call to you from that other room. You don't have to sit there and watch it. You don't have to use an app to understand how it works. You don't have to connect it to a network to make it work. It just works. Um, there's also the idea that technology should be empowering the periphery. Here's all your peripheral attention. What can you do with that? What different alert styles can you use in order to empower that? This is a silly example, but this is a thing that you wear around your back, and it's the LumoBack Smart Posture Sensor. I can see some of you trying to sit up straight now. <laughs> uh, but the idea is that you wear it, and it just sends you a little tiny buzz when you have bad posture. So the idea is that it's not sending everybody a buzz. It's not posting to Twitter. It's not sending you an email. It's just giving you a tiny buzz. OK, change your behavior. Right? So um, the idea behind this is that it's not intruding on anybody else's attention either. Because when you get an alert on your phone and you look at it, it intrudes on other people's attention. You might be in a conversation. They might take out their phone too. You might get distracted by like the other app and, and saying, oh, sorry, I don't want to install that software update that keeps you know, showing up. Uh, I had an employee that had an insulin pump. And the insulin pump would beep. And he was incredibly embarrassed by the insulin pump beeping because he said, when I'm in a movie theater, when I'm in a meeting, you know, when I'm in a, at a funeral, I get this beep and everybody else gets distracted. And that's a personal device, so it should have a buzz. Also, if he's in a really loud situation, how can he hear the beep? He needs to feel a buzz instead. So it was just a, a mismatch. Now maybe, if you were designing this insulin pump for somebody who needed a supervisor, maybe you could have it beep. But you need to be able to change the alert uh, based on the context. And just having that be default was, was incredibly difficult. It just showed how different he was constantly instead of just being able to move on with his life with a restorative technology. Uh, this is an example of weather status lighting. It's a hue controller. Uh, I mean, all of you have probably seen these, these advertisements for like the single person living in San Francisco in the perfect condo, and when they wake up in the morning, it's like, hello, Dave, how's it going? Here's your stocks, here's your email, here's your personal data, here's your doctor's appointments. It's going to be sunny, and it's this horrible computer-simulated voice. You know, and, and I can imagine embarrassing moments where like the guy has somebody over and like they wake up together and then like she gets to see all of the personal data on the dashboard and yelled, you know, and he can't say like turn it off, turn it off, because it's it's set too loud and it's really annoying. But in this case, it just this is a light bulb that just shows you by feeling, by light temperature, what the temperature, what the weather's going to be like for the day. It's just like a weather forecasting light bulb. And if you want to see more, then you look at the dashboard that, you know, it's just an iPad screwed into the wall. You know, this is my old kitchen, right? So it's just, all right, here's, here's your weather status lighting. It's really simple. It's going to be sunny. It's yellow. It's going to be rainy. It's blue. It's going to be overcast. It's kind of like white gray. Gray is an impossible color to make, but you can, you can make uh, some sort of kind of simulation of what it's going to be. But this is not intruding. It's more making use of your ambient attention, your ambient awareness. This is another example. There is a, a software technology called Beeminder. Basically, you try to keep track of your goals. And if you go off track, they take your money. Um, <laughs> 
which is the idea behind the sting and the B minder, uh, but they take your money logarithmically, so uh, people really don't want to go off track. Uh, some people will track like many different things. I mean, this is a light status indicator that can be used for anything, but uh, people will just be checking their apps all day. They'll be like, am I off track on each of these goals? If not, okay, but they become these compulsive, like Skinnerian rat clicking type creatures. You know, they're like, oh no, oh no, I might get off track. But you don't need to check this app all the time. All you need to know is that green means you don't have to check anything. Yellow means that you might have to check something, but you have a two day window on it and it's okay. Or red, you need to check something now. Right? Why do you need to be clicking all the time? You can have something that gives you ambient awareness of what you need to check or not. So you're just compressing the information into different spaces or different variables or different awarenesses. Technology should be informative while in calming you. I worked on a, a kind of a lab project last year which was, let's look at all the data that your phone already gets about you, uh, sleep and, and your movement and your sedentary time, and if you have anything else plugged into HealthKit, you can you know, get your heart rate and everything else. And what I wanted to do is, instead of a dashboard that says, you have this many thousand steps and like you're doing well, or you need to step more, it just, we just made this like little tiny thing that would show you at a moment's glance what you had been doing during the day. You know, this is what my day looks like this is a not as good day. A good day would be like I took tons of pictures and I was really active going from place to place, right? So I'm able to see what my good day is and be able to kind of replicate that. Or I could look at my map of my day at the end of the day and say, I had a bad day. Oh, here's why. I can change my behavior now. But I don't have to have the machine telling me that. I can just make use of this visualization. It's not giving me any numbers, it's just giving me a fraction of some time. And you can like uh, roll around, you can actually scroll around and see your future in this too, by all your Google Calendar appointments and things like that. So you can actually see like, ah, oh, I will have a good day coming up statistically. But you can make that, <laughs> you can make that assumption if you want, because you're the human uh, understanding the data at the end. Uh, technology should be amplifying the best of humanity and the best of technology. Technology is really, really good at going through lots and lots of data and sorting it out. And humans are really good curators and understanding the context. And so I really like the idea of, of technologies like Google because they're not telling you the result you want. They're using bots and what other people have done and connecting you to a human switchboard. And then you get the results and you say, this is what I want out of the results. And a lot of people are trying to make companies that make the choices for you or automate everything, which ends up getting you into these horrible systems where you don't really have any agency anymore. That's where all these like kind of war game systems come from in the first place. By the way, we need more war games films for this generation, I think, because we're the same thing is happening again, so we have to be really careful about that. Um, this is my favorite way to wake up. Uh, oftentimes you wake up and you're really tired because you're waking up in the wrong sleep cycle. So this is an alarm clock that watches your sleep cycle using the accelerometer on your phone. You put it upside down on your bed in airplane mode, plug it into the wall, it will monitor your sleep, and then it will wake you up in the right sleep cycle, which is fantastic. So every time I go to sleep at night, I set my alarm, it will wake me up before the alarm is supposed to, to come up in the right sleep cycle. And then in the morning, it will show you your sleep data graph. This isn't a really great graph. It's kind of like jet lagged sleep, plus like some really great dreams um, between 5.30 and 6 a.m. Those were really fantastic dreams. But I was in bed for about nine hours and I got a sleep quality of 98. So when I woke up, when, when you wake up, it, it gives you a little rating system. So I'll be like, yeah, I was happy. And then it starts to correlate the data. So actually it'll say like, did you walk for fun? Did you drink coffee? Over time, if I walk 10,000 steps, I have a 20% better sleep night. So every day I'm like, ooh, I should walk to 10,000 steps. Not because I want to track it on my like Nike Plus wristband, but because I know I'll get a better night of sleep. I can stay in bed less, wake up earlier, be super excited. So there's these kind of things that like a human can make more sense of, where if you just have the data, it works out pretty well. And it's a, it's a calm way, I just put this in. I'm not you know, managing this weird dashboard every day where I have to plug everything into it. It's just using the best of what technology does and what the best of humanity does. This is my favorite one. Technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. There are all of these weird devices that, that uh, hang out on the uncanny valley edge, threatening to like fall into this black hole of doom. It's, it's just horrible. They're, they have these bad human voices all the time. Um, 
So here's, here's an example. So Natalie Germanjenko, who was an artist at, at, at Park, she created this live wire. Uh, and it was just a piece of plastic that hung from the ceiling and it would just whir around, it was attached to the network. Whenever somebody was doing something interesting, there, were, there was a lot of network data. And so people would like, ooh, something's happening. And then they'd like either like, hang out around it or they'd go and talk to somebody about it. So this was kind of a way of, you know, we're not gonna tell you what's going on, but something is going on, you should come and hang out. And it was just kind of telling you this through this ambient like whirring and movement sound, you know, this kind of thing, this like physical alert in, in real time and real space. The Roomba is fantastic because, and I don't know how many of you know the story of the Roomba, but um, the inventor of the Roomba was at MIT. She wanted to make a robotic vacuum and she was told, well, you know, you can make it for the military first in order to get the price down all the components. So there are giant Roombas roving around detecting bombs. <laughs> it works out pretty well. Uh, but once it got miniaturized, uh, you just have these tones. If the robot is done, it goes da da da, because it's happy that it's done. And if it gets stuck, it goes da da. But the whole idea is you don't need to translate that into tons of different languages. It's a simple light and tone. And you as the human are picking it up and helping the robot out. So it's not an enhancing technology, it's just kind of a normal technology. And it becomes so normal that cats like to ride it all the time and you <laughs> see them in YouTube videos. Uh, Weiser came up with this kind of status tone alarm clock. This is quite hard to pull off because oftentimes people will schedule things all the time and like block out like, I'm free. And so if, the, if this alarm clock read that, it would just wake up somebody in a, a really harsh way. But the idea behind this alarm clock is you have a different tone for the types of things that you're doing for the day. So if you have a really crazy day coming up, it'll wake you up in this kind of jolting, like, let's, like, let's wake up, da, 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 you know. Or if you have a really relaxing Saturday, planned out, then it would just wake you up in a very calm way, gradually, so you get more sleep. And the idea is you can do the entire thing by tones, because the issue is that if you have the same alarm clock tone a lot, after a while you just fall asleep to it because you're so used to it. But if you have slightly different tones, that's more generative audio, you can do a lot more things with it. And that becomes something that can, that can change your attitude and change your tempo. Technology should be considerative of social norms. There's this kind of metabolism rate that it takes for technology to show up in the world uh, because it might be ready 20, 30, 40 years before, but we still have to deal with all the standards and the ways to get it into people's hands and the social changes that have to happen. When elevators first came out, people complained that their eardrums hurt and so they were artificially slowed down to accommodate for humans. So it's not usually that technology isn't ready for us. Humans aren't usually ready for technology. So we have to be very considerate of, of that and, and plan our releases properly. Um, I have this small graph where there's the, this idea of scary technology, like Google Glass is fear-inducing because it's expensive and it's enhancing technology. It's above the norm. Normal technology is quite invisible because normal technology is, okay, now all of us have smartphones with cameras. But 10 years ago, it was, let's all have feature phones. And then the restorative technology, like glasses, restore you to the norm, and therefore that's accepted technology. If we look at feature phones, when they first came out, they had you know, very limited features, text and voice. They were widely adopted over time, and it became a norm to understand how to use these phones and to kind of be socially apt with them, even though some people still aren't. Uh, but the arrival of the smartphone camera set off all these privacy concerns. Now everyone's going to take a picture of me as I walk down the street. But what we all know that people with smartphones do is they take selfies and they take pictures of their food as a pre-digestive process so that it tastes better when they eat it. <laughs> when we look at Google Glass, it wasn't an iterative process. It took, it took all these different technologies and features that were all new at the same time and it, it released them all in the same, in the same way. It didn't say, let's wait for the supply chain to be cheap enough to add a camera and then add a video and add text and add Bluetooth and add Wi-Fi. It was, let's release all the things, make it very difficult for people to develop on because you have to be a Google Explorer. And that was really difficult um, because the developer onboarding wasn't fun. People weren't having fun with it. People weren't playing with it. Every time I see somebody play with a technology, uh, it becomes really exciting. I say, oh, that's probably going to be the next thing because they can play with it in terms of consumer technology. And because of that, because there were too many features, people just latched onto one thing. They said, oh, the thing is filming me all the time. It's terrifying. So I wore this around for a month just to gather responses. And the number one response was, are you recording me right now? There was another issue in which, you know, on a, a video camera, you have that little record button, or that like little record indicator, and it's a light. 
right? That's a piece of column technology. It's a status indicator, and it tells you when it's recording and not when it isn't recording. But with Google Glass, there wasn't even a status indicator. So people were like, oh no, it's recording me all the time. That was the default thing. Instead of building something up as, as a prosthetic for driving to give you driving directions for a long time, and then slowly over five or six years, um, making that a, a better piece of technology. So when we looked at um, the iPhone launch, we had all this developer onboarding beforehand. We had very limited features. People couldn't even like make an app yet. Um, but then when you could, people had already known what the phone could do, and then they said, okay, I'm going to make an app. And my favorite example of an app that showed the capabilities of the platform was the Fart app. <laughs> like, it was just like a whoopee cushion app, right? So it was easy enough that a 14-year-old could make it. It handled the touch sensor and the sound library. All you have to do is say, let's add the touch library and the sound library, and as a developer, I can make these things happen. And then suddenly you, you had all these fun source code videos on the web. It's like these 14-year-olds, 13-year-olds would say, here's how to make an app. And then that launched a whole industry because it was really silly. You know, those apps were the ones that showed people that you could do things with this new device. Uh, the right amount of tech is the minimum to solve the problem. And again, I always see people like trying to complicate things by adding all these features and adding as much technology as possible. Uh, when I look at things like this that are ubiquitous, that no one really cares about, uh, but just notice in their, in their ambient attention, I get really excited because, number one, it's a pictogram, doesn't need to be um, extended into a bunch of different languages. It doesn't really need to have a sound on it. You can have your glasses off and be red, green, colorblind and still understand what this means. This is fantastic and simple. And because of that, it is mundane and doesn't, no one even cares about it. And that's how you know, a lot of these good technologies should be. They, we shouldn't even notice them. And that's why Bell Isaac is really exciting because nobody knows these, these things behind the scenes. Um, but they exist and they, and they make use of things. This one is, is kind of a, a new type thing. Like technology should make use of the near and the far. You shouldn't have to be a system administrator to live in your own home. It doesn't make sense, right? Unless you want to change things and mess with things, and that's really fantastic. But again, if you have to go to the internet to turn your lights on and off, what is the use of that? Why aren't you using a local network? Or just use the electricity in your house and the switch. If you really want to remote control it, fine. But if everybody's on some network, it can be easily hacked. I mean, there's, there's so many people installing webcams in their houses, and there are now sites that you can control people's unsecured webcams, right? Which is why it's a good idea to be part of a hacker space. You can see what people are doing with the new technology from the Internet of Things, not to mention privacy and, and security. Uh, so we had kind of had this kind of mainframe area where there were many people for one device, and then we had personal computers where there was like one or two people per device, and then you kind of have this cloud, it's not really right to say it, but like remote style mainframes where you're going far away to get your technology, and then you have mobile where you're kind of making the use of the near and the far. The problem is if you turn your phones to airplane mode, what does that actually allow you to do? Like, there aren't that many apps that work in airplane mode on your phone. There's not a lot of things that are being stored. Um, I like the idea, even though we don't know what's going to happen with it yet, of distributed computing or, and personal servers, where you keep all the data on your own data file, somewhere secure where that lives, and when you go to a doctor, you say, I'm going to give you my information for 24 hours for the purpose of treatment, and then I'm going to take it back, or something like that, and get new data added to my file. Or the idea of distributed computing. Everybody was watching this Game of Thrones show, and everybody's taking it from this central server. It shouldn't be that way. It should be able to take it from the people around you in your same apartment building until you build up enough of a file that it doesn't take this crazy amount of bandwidth. Um, but these are, these are emerging things that have always been emerging. We'll see what happens over time when they continue to emerge. Um, it should be self-explanatory. I put these principles of calm technology into a slide. Uh, you don't have to read all of them. So if good design allows people to accomplish their goals in the least amount of moves, you take the moves that it takes for somebody to complete their goal away until there's nothing left to take away, then a calm technology does the same thing with the least amount of mental cost. How much mental cost can you take away so that people are left to be human instead of messing around with the technology all the time? Although that's very fun, a lot of people don't have the bandwidth to do that because they're so restrained in all of these other different ways. So a person's primary task should be 
not computing, but just being human. And again, my favorite quote is that the scarce resource is not going to be technology. It's going to be attention. And how we make use of that is how we will interact with technology in the future, especially if we have more and more of these devices. We need to think of more and more clever ways in order to use them. So I, I wrote this book um, because I was really excited about this topic, and that just came out. And I also made this website that has these principles on it. Um, but the idea behind this is I've just been really excited because Mark Weiser, he died early and he wasn't around to see this whole Internet of Things world and I just wanted to bring his legacy more into the future and, and talk about what it would be like in more of a world today as we begin to encounter these issues. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amber. Um, looking forward to the day when we do have calm technology and. Uh, I think uh, the network is a strong part of that. Uh, would love to hear uh, questions, uh, questions from the audience. Yes. Thank you. A very interesting talk. It seems that calm technology is a close corollary to what we might need in elder care. With an aging population, people have less understanding and ability to interface with technology. What are your views as sort of key developments that we may want to see from calm technology going into elder care? Uh, that's a great question. Um, my, one of my mentors is, is 74, although he acts about 25, and I still regard him as such. But uh, he, uh, and he's the one who got me to get an iPhone too. So uh, we have these talks all the time where he says, you know, a lot of people live independently, but let's say somebody has dementia and there's all these design schools right now and they're like, well, they can wear this like new wristwatch thing and it'll connect and it'll give them all these tones. I was like, no, because the first thing they're going to want to do is say, what is this weird foreign object? Like rip it off, throw it away and then like leave and like try to find a bus stop to like get out of town, right? To go back home. Um, there have been some solutions like the bus stop example out, outside of a home, they've just installed a bus stop and the bus stop doesn't work. And so people will just get into a fit of dementia and they will leave, they will find the bus stop and they will sit there waiting until that period of time comes over and some, some person will come out and say, all right, you know, uh, let's, you know, let's talk and then get them back and to a safe place. But the idea is there's this holding area so they're not just like walking around being terrified of everything because everything is confusing. Um, there's also ideas of, um, you know, remote monitoring of, of blood pressure, remote monitoring of heart rate. The idea of, of slipping and falling is a really big issue. So can you have a tub that understands the slipping and falling? Can you have something on the person that understands that? A very strange solution to this, which I don't, I don't I'm, I'm not sure about, is there was this uh, Japanese inventor who created two things. One was called like Panic Park, which has all of these different sharp edges. Um, so you go into the park and you will get hurt, but everything's at a non-standard size to get your brain to wake up again. And then there's also um, an elderly care home that's independent apartment living, where when you close the door, the home itself reconfigures and everything changes. And so every time you come back in, you have to refigure out where you are, which enhances... <laughs> See, I don't... <laughs> I think uh, a lot of interesting things are coming out of Sweden. I've, I've been following like Swedish development and, and technology for a long time um, in terms of connecting these systems. Um, another thing is like figuring out, okay, somebody slipped and fell, instead of having you know, 911 come, let's figure out who's in the area who can you know, come in and assist. Uh, let's have the technology readily available. Um, I also like the idea of like bringing in furniture that somebody's grown up with to make them more comfortable. But I think one of the biggest issues is not necessarily the technology, although I do have one more example. There is this robotic seal that's used in, in Japanese elder, elderly homes um, because the idea is the, the helper animals are kind of expensive and they can only come in sometimes. And having somebody come in and care for this non-human object that doesn't have an uncanny valley because it's an animal and it's cute. Uh, they have to like pet it, they have to feed it. It distracts them from their own problems and their own pains and they're able to like share in caretaking and have a purpose. Uh, which, which leads me to my final point. Like a lot of times you see people, which really makes me mad, they go into a home and they get put on pause. They're just sitting there. 
they don't have real interaction. The people who are taking care of them are treating them like infants. And it makes me really mad because people need to have a lot of brain stimulation, not just from books, but from social interactions. And so I, I think, you know, being around lots of people, like the idea of, of having somebody be in a home with lots of people around them, being able to stay at home and get cared for is, you know, the optimal, the optimal point. Um, but there are so many issues with the entire system as is and being uncomfortable and going into kind of like a foreign institution of a hospital and being kind of disembodied out of your regular environment. I mean, these are things that I'm quite upset about and you know, we need to use both technology and humans to, to help out. Um, and it's still evolving, so I'm, I'm, I'm watching it very closely, but I've, I've only seen very few things so far that have made sense that haven't been weird foreign objects or calendar things with like glowing orbs that people just are like, I don't understand. You expect me to learn all this new technology? Um, there is this suit that people can put on. I think this was in the New York Times a while ago where you put like a suit on that will make you like 90 years old and like changes your vision um, so that it's, you know, you need to, it's, it's harder to focus. Um, it's a different color of vision. Um, you know, you have these kind of gloves so that you can't like click on things as well, and then they'll force the people building the technology to use this in order to make technology for somebody. And I think that's really important. Oftentimes, you get people coming up with these ideas. Okay, we're gonna make this great technology for somebody, but we've never talked to anybody in this demographic. It's like, no, like, at least you know, wear the suit and then test it out in all these places and see if it's actually interactive. Like, I find that the, the best things I've found is like, how about have an after-school reading service where like the kids read to the people in the home, or how about, I mean, this has worked already with all these dogs uh, that are like at a shelter. All these kids will come in and practice their reading on the dogs because the dogs are not judgmental. I mean, there's gotta be, <laughs> there's just these odd pairings, right, that you can do uh, where you take subsets of people that are not being utilized properly and who are bored and who get depressed and die early and help extend their, their lives and make things better. You know, it's not about dying young anymore, it's about having quality of life for an extra like 60 years bef uh, longer than you expected to live. How do you keep people occupied? I'm taking way too much time on this one. I, I was just applying calm technology. Uh. <laughs> yeah, <It> was good. <laughs> My ambient sense of awareness showed that you were getting impatient. Great. Uh, 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 thank you very much for, for <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you and you after. Uh. <laughs> Amber, thank you very much, Amber. I'd like to invite Marcus Weldon. We have go. to go and uh, give you this, Amber. Oh, this is awesome. So you have to go and stand over there, otherwise okay, you don't get it. <laughs> this, is, this is great. See, that, there like would have been a calmer way to do that. <laughs> I should have given you some yeah, visual cue. you would have just uh, thrown it into my hands and <laughs> yeah. we're done. <laughs>